Thank you very much, Sergey. It's great to be here with you all. I uh, wish I could go to ACTRU with you, but I can't. I think it's the first year I haven't been since the summer school started. Um, I'm only here today, so I'm sorry I won't get to meet each of you, um, but hopefully we will meet somehow. Um, as Sergey mentioned, I, I've worked in the Arctic for 52 years, and that means I've been in the Arctic every year for 52 years somewhere. Um, what I will do now for the next one hour, I hope you're feeling strong, but in, w in the next one hour I will give you some very simple, very general overviews of many topics. So I can't go into real detail about any, co any particular topic. You may know far more than I do about some of the things I will mention, but I'm trying to give everyone a background. So let's start. <coughs> First of all, what is the Arctic? And that may sound a very silly question, but in fact, what the Arctic is depends on what your perspective is. And for me, there is only one really pure definition of the Arctic, and that is everywhere above the Arctic Circle. That way, it's a very easy astronomical definition, because if you're inside this circle, then you see the sun at midnight on Midsummer's Day, and at mid day on midwinter's day the sun is below the horizon it's completely dark and no one can argue with that but then if you start talking to other people from different perspectives then alaska is arctic for political reasons and places in russia are arctic for political reasons so it's very difficult to actually define the arctic what i like to do is take a, an environmental definition so i like to go with the tree line so for example if we helsinki is off the map here but if we look over here at approximately the same latitude as Helsinki, in Helsinki we have a big city, we have agriculture, we have forestry. At the same latitude in eastern Canada, we have polar bears and tundra. So it depends on where you are as to what the environment shows you. So here we have tundra environment well south of the Arctic Circle. Here in Fenris Gandia, we have boreal forest or the taiga north of the Arctic Circle. So the environment is complicated, but I like to go with the environmental uh, definition. And incidentally, these changes in climate for the same latitude are really due to ocean currents. So the warm North Atlantic drift causes an 11 degrees Celsius difference between eastern Canada and uh, western Europe. So what I would like to do now is take you on a very brief tour of the Arctic through my eyes. Um, if we start off the, the Arctic, remember, is an ocean surrounded by land masses. It's different from the Antarctic. And, of course, what we have is sea ice, big icebergs. And this is, uh, by the way, a Greenlander, when I was doing my PhD a long time ago, bringing whale meat off the sea ice onto the land. There's not much difference in winter. And the land at these northern latitudes is characterized by a lot of bare ground, rock. It's uh, at an early stage of colonization and uh, glaciers flowing down to the sea. As we travel even further south, when the glaciers have gone, they leave these beautiful U-shaped valleys behind. As we progress in some regions further south, we have polar deserts. It may come as a surprise to you that uh, there are deserts in the Arctic. These are cold deserts. Deserts are defined by precipitation, not temperature. And these are very dry areas like uh, Eastern Siberia was uh, 30,000 years ago, so there was no ice cap in Eastern Siberia because it was too dry. <coughs> and gradually as we come further south, then the vegetation, you can see here, it's less than 5% cover of the ground. The vegetation uh, can colonize more, and we end up with almost a total uh, coverage of vegetation. Um, we have a big patterning here. This is uh, polygonal tundra with uh, ice wedges found in many coastal areas of Alaska and Siberia. And then as we travel south, we come to an ecotone. I don't know whether you know what an ecotone is, but it's the, the boundary between different biogeochemical zones. And the biggest one in the world is the tundra tiger um, ecotone. This is the tiger in the background, and this is the tundra in the foreground. Once you cross that line going south, you have forestry, agriculture, uh, settlements, high biodiversity, high productivity. As soon as you come north into the tundra, 
all those things are reversed. Very low populations, very low productivity, low biodiversity, um, etc. And this line, to some extent, is caused by temperature. So, of course, the ecologists interested in the Arctic are very interested in what happens to that line, how it's moving north and displacing the tundra. We also have to remember that in the Arctic, and particularly here in Russia, the Arctic is characterised by huge rivers. And Sergei and his group are working along the river Ob. And in fact, that's one of... Thank you, Sergei. This is one of your photos um, of the Ob in spring when the ice is breaking up. Um, but I, as far as I remember, the flood plain of this river is 60 kilometres wide and that's second only to the river Amazon and it's about two and a half thousand kilometres long so it starts in the Altai where you are. Um, so we have several of these rivers taking species, heat, carbon, nutrients, pollutants all the way from the south to the Arctic Ocean and of course these were transport routes for people too. The Arctic has a unique wildlife and of course you all know what these are um, but I'm just showing the, uh, the Fenescandian wildlife. Okay, for those of you who don't know, Arctic fox is declining in many areas. European brown bear is increasing in many areas. The wolves are increasing, but are being shot out by people who don't like them. Uh, musk oxen are, are pretty stable. Um, reindeer or caribou, if you live in North America, um, are declining. There's only one herd in North America that isn't declining so far. And just as an aside, the, 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 uh, the porcupine caribou herd that is surviving and doing well over uh, spends the summer in the Alaskan Wildlife Refuge, which is now going to be uh, drilled for oil. So the last remaining good reindeer herd in, uh, in Alaska is threatened now. And these, this is a, a lemming, and lemmings are keystone species. They are species that control the vegetation, but they also control the populations of animals that feed on them like the arctic fox and like the, um, the snowy owl. These lemmings are characterised by population fluctuations, years in which populations every four to five years are extremely high and then you have a lot of predators that can breed because they eat the lemmings and then there's a crash and then after four or five years the, the population picks up again. But these animals are declining, the population peaks are declining because of unfavourable winter snow conditions and I'll mention those later. And of course, when that food source declines, then the vegetation grows more, so you have a greening of the Arctic, and also um, the, the animals that eat them decline as well. People. We shouldn't forget people. There are uh, a lot of people living in the Arctic. The, the number varies, again, according to the definition. And this is why politicians play games. Uh, if you're in the Arctic, then you get a tax allowance. So... There are lots of games going on, but we can say between 4 to 13 million people spread over the Arctic, however you define that. And most of the big cities in the Arctic are here in Russia. There are very few big cities in the Arctic outside Russia. And of course, there are, there are many um, indigenous peoples in the Arctic, many different uh, types. So you see Inuit and uh, uh, Nenets and Chuchki. Um, but there are many more, and particularly, again, here in, um, in Russia. There are also people from the West, who, or from the South, I should say, who've lived in the Arctic for a thousand years, and they get concerned when we start talking about indigenous people. The Icelanders and the, the Faroese, uh, sorry, where are here, and the Faroese, they have been there for over a thousand years, so they consider themselves as indigenous people. But in fact, these people have been there for up to 30,000 years in some cases. And just some more uh, shots of these people. This is uh, Nenets reindeer racing at Nadim in the Yamal area. Uh, again, one of Sergei's beautiful photos of Hamti. And uh, this is a confirmation at church, Christian confirmation of Greenlanders. All these are bead necklaces. And uh, uh, Nenets um, reindeer, again, from Nadim. Um, these people are not just suffering from climate change. Uh, trying to adapt to a new climate. They also are, are suffering from globalisation. So within just a relatively short time period, you can see a woman here with a beautiful reindeer and reindeer in the background, a beautiful traditional clothes, but she's on a mobile phone and there's a snow scooter in the background. So these people are, are, are dealing with huge changes in their lives and in just one or two generations. And just another beautiful photo of the Nenets. I've been very... Um, 
privilege to have, have been in, into the Yamal area and uh, Nadim and so on. And these are the tomb, the tent where these people live. Uh, it's a very hard life and traditional clothing, beautiful child with on the reindeer sledge. Iconic people, but living a very hard life and very confusing life for them. And then a completely different type of life that's not based on land, not based on, on reindeer herding. But this is a, um, a place, Umanak in Greenland, West Greenland. Here there are no soils, just bare rock. Um, the reason for this locality is probably this big rock, that when you're out on the sea ice hunting for whales and, and seals, this is the only way you know where home is, by looking for that rock. So um, this is a big signpost. But how do you have a game of football when you live in a place like that? It's not, not easy. Probably as far north in the world as people naturally live. This is a place called Karnak uh, in northwest Greenland. And this is a hunter's house. And although it may uh, offend you, um, this is the way they live. So you see the polar bear skins. Okay? And there's a musk oxen skin. And this is a frame for stretching seal skins. But that's their life. Without hunting and fishing, they would die. They survive on the sea, entirely on the sea. S sorry? No. Okay. And there are other hard lives too. Uh, this is from the northern polar Urals. And this is where a miner lives uh, who's working on the nickel mines in the, in the north polar Urals. So y you've had a snapshot of the uh, where people live in the Arctic in very different conditions from fairly modern but very cold isolated conditions all the way through to the hunters and the reindeer herders. Just one little word about the Arctic uh, environment. I'm going to tease you now. If Yeah, I'm going to tease you. What are these? Anyone want to guess? Uh, um, polar night? Polar night? What aspect of the polar night? Uh, Sorry? Aurora. Sorry? Aurora. No, no. Uh, everyone wants to guess the aurora. It's not the aurora. Um, it's very difficult to, to actually photograph the aurora. The aurora looks something like this, but it's changing all the time. What these are, these are polar stratic clouds. These are clouds at 70 kilometers in the atmosphere. And if anyone wants a discussion about whether climate change is man-made or not, these clouds hold the one of the keys to understanding that it is man-made. So if anyone wants a discussion about that, then ask me about polar stratospheric, polar stratospheric clouds. OK, so that was a very brief general introduction to the Arctic. When I started my work 52 years ago, no one was interested in the Arctic. I knew every researcher in the Arctic because there were so few of us. And People thought I was absolutely mad going to the Arctic because no one knew what it was really, except for the explorers. It was a very different world 52 years ago. And incidentally, there's a paradigm shift in my lifetime that when I started my work, I was interested in how animals and plants survive at the limits of their distribution in these very cold areas. Now, 52 years later, the paradigm shift, and I'm interested in how these animal and plants survive in a warm region, that's, uh, th where it's the warmth that's threatening them and not the cold. Um, but yeah, so when I started my career, no one was interested in the Arctic. But now we have countries all around the world interested in the Arctic. And I don't want to offend anyone, but we have uh, Singapore, we have the Czech Republic, uh, we have South Korea, we have China. Sorry? China. <laughs> yeah, China, Poland, etc., etc. Uh, all the countries that are interested in the world uh, are interested in the Arctic. Now, there are two reasons for this. One is, I think, a bad reason. Uh, and what a good reason. The bad reason is money. Um, money and geopolitics. That in the Arctic you find all the heavy metals and precious metals that you could dream of. Diamonds and gold. Here you have one third of the world's remaining oil and gas supplies, fossil fuels. You also have new shipping routes opening up that make the contact between Southeast Asia and Europe 40% of the journey of going through the Suez Canal around India. You also have new fisheries opening up. So there is a lot of money to be made in the Arctic. And that's why even, even my own country, I left it out of the list, but my own country is getting really involved in the Arctic now, simply because of the commercial opportunities it may open up. 
And just this is one example. As I told you, I was privileged uh, in many, many different ways. In December last year, I was invited by the Deputy Governor of Yamal to go and see the new uh, LNG liquid um, gas uh, liquid liquefaction plant, natural gas liquefaction plant uh, in Yamal at a place called Sabeta. I was the only scientist there. I was the only person from either UK or, or North America there. So I was highly privileged. And what we found was this incredible place the size of a city. I, they put 30,000 people into this place to build this in four years. 40% of the funding comes from China. I think a little bit comes from France. And this is a, a ship from South Korea taking on the liquid gas. So while we scientists are talking about sea ice retreat, what that means for economy of the world, uh, it's being done here in Russia. So this is a mega opportunity that's being seized by Russia. Um, I don't know, this slide's got out of order, so forgive me, but one thing we have to remember about the, um, the, the, the frozen uh, sea and the frozen rivers and frozen ice is that for historical, for, since historical times, these have been major transport routes. Um, so this is a lake in uh, uh, northern um, Sweden where I used to work a lot. Uh, this is outside uh, Samoil uh, Samoilov in the Lena Delta. And the, the indigenous peoples use these lakes and rivers um, as uh, transport routes, and people do today. I think these are called Zermik in uh, Russian, um, and there are 12,000 kilometres of them. But the problem is now is it's getting warmer. The conditions are becoming very um, uh, unpredictable and dangerous. Okay, I, I mentioned there are two um, aspects of climate change why people around the world are interested. One was the commercial and geopolitical reasons. The second is that the Arctic has contributed to our planet's uh, well-being uh, for millennia. And it has been, in, a, in one way, the refrigerator of planet Earth, cooling the Earth. And it's had a whole series of negative feedbacks on the greenhouse gas problem over time. One of them is by reflecting heat from a shiny surface. When you have snow and ice, it has high albedo. That means high reflectivity. You can see the snow is reflecting light, that's heat back into space. Where you have vegetation coming through the snow, then that absorbs radiation. So the Arctic has resulted in a cooling. In addition to that, Arctic soils, I'll mention this a little bit later, have captured the greenhouse gas carbon um, as carbon dioxide in photosynthesis and stored that in many soils of the Arctic because decomposition processes in the cold soils with permafrost underneath is rate limiting compared with photosynthetic fixation of carbon. So you get an accumulation. You don't get that in the temperate latitudes. It's a very slow accumulation. The Arctic also has a role to play in sea level. And this is our, one of our predictions of sea level rise, the effect it will have on Bangladesh with uh, a one metre rise in sea level, perhaps in the next 100 years. Uh, and it's mainly controlled by the ice on land, which melts and flows into the sea. So just as a for example, um, 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age, when there was a lot of fresh water locked up in, in ice sheets, which were much bigger than today, then the sea level was about 100 metres lower than it is today. And you could walk from North America in, uh, into, um, into Siberia and from Britain to France. Yeah, and as th these three aspects actually um, control temperature of the Earth. But the way, another important way the Arctic uh, controls the climate of planet Earth, not adjusting the planetary um, temperature, but redistributing the planetary temperature is through the ocean currents. And I, I just gave you one example of that, where the temperature here on the Gulf Stream, which is collecting warm water in the tropics, in sur warm surface waters, in the Arctic, it exchanges that heat and forms the deep return currents, the cold currents. So here we get the warmth in Western Europe, and there you get the uh, no such warming and the cold currents returning off the eastern coast of, of Greenland and Canada. And the Arctic also uh, affects biodiversity. And for those of you interested in bird life, uh, the statistics are there are about 600 million birds 
um, migrate to the Arctic each summer. And that is a very, very big number. And about 41% of all European bird species go to the Arctic in summer. So if something happens in the Arctic, then that will affect global biodiversity, in, certainly in terms of birds. OK, so what's happening to the Arctic's temperature? I've, I've kept on mentioning climate change, but I haven't given you any details. Forget that one. This is just temperatures right from when the first uh, global temperature record began, 1892 to 1896. This is one to look at. This is the temperature increase in 2013 to 2017, so it's fairly recent, um, compared with the period 1951 to 1980. And it's a colour chart. So the red colours denote most warming, the blue is a cooling, and the white areas are areas of no change. But what you want to take home from this graph are two things. One is that most of the warming is in the Arctic. So if you live in Britain, um, here or eastern coast of North America, you can actually discuss is there climate change or not. If you live here, there is no discussion. It's happened. Um, so that's one take home message. And then the other is from this graph. And in this graph, we've just integrated, OK? We've collapsed all the longitudes. And for a temperature, this is temperature. And this is going from the Antarctic, down here, all the way through the, the, the equator, somewhere around here. And as we go into the northern hemisphere, we hit the, the North Pole, here. And look what we see. This is called Arctic amplification of temperature. Now, the frightening thing is if we look at that temperature increase, we see it's about 2.8 degrees C. Now, remember the Paris Agreement, keep global temperature below 1.5. It's meaningless in terms of the Arctic. We're already way beyond that limit that uh, people are trying to get to. What are the effects of this warming climate in the Arctic? Well, the first effect is on the cryosphere. And the cryosphere is the frozen part of the planet. The sea ice, the river ice and lake ice, and the permafrost. And this is just one thing I hope you would smile. Because the, the Arctic has been one place in the world where ships' captains, when they're navigating, have to be careful of pedestrians. Smile, please. It's supposed to be a joke. But uh, the days of this happening, when you, ships' captains have to be careful, look out for... Uh, uh, for pedestrians has gone now because we're, we're not seeing these uh, situations. In 1952, I worked in an area in Greenland like this and every year, every winter, the, the harbour was uh, frozen up. The boats were actually frozen in. They weren't breaking the ice like this. And every spring, an icebreaker had to come to break the ice in the harbour so that a food ship could come in from Denmark. Now there is no ice in that harbour in Greenland. So the changes are huge. Graphically, I, I don't know whether you can see, but there is a purple line. Can you just see this purple line? OK, good. Well, this is the long-term extent of sea ice in the Arctic. And this is the minimum extent. So through the summer, the sea ice declines and goes towards the North Pole. And then in the... Sp uh, uh, sorry, let me get start again. In, in the winter, the sea ice starts to expand. So in autumn, after September, the ice grows and grows and grows and grows further away from uh, the North Pole. And then, of course, in spring, the reverse happens. The ice starts coming back again until it meets September. And it, in September, that's the changeover when it, it stops retreating and starts advancing. So if you measure the extent of sea ice in September, you get the minimum. So that line is the minimum. OK, for a long term. And what you see in that minimum, it touches far east of Siberia, Pevek. It touches a Timir Peninsula, and it closes the Northwest Passage. So what that means you can't navigate around the coastline of Siberia or go through the Northwest Passage without an icebreaker. But now, if you watch some of the lines tracking over time, you will see gradually, look, it's ice has moved away from these land masses. So for the first time, you can actually navigate these waters. This is a graphic presentation. These are millions of square kilometers of ice. 
Uh, from 1978, it only goes to 2014, but the trend is con continues. So you can see the downward trend. We're losing sea ice. And over that period, if you look at the numbers, it's three and a half million square kilometers. So these numbers, eight to four here, are millions of square kilometers. So losing 3.5 million square kilometers is a huge, huge number. And also, what I don't show and is that in areas around Greenland and, this and Ellesmere Island, you have accumulations of multi-year ice. This is ice that has been formed uh, several years ago um, and is only very slowly melting. And there's very little of that uh, uh, multi-year ice left now. Another part of the cryosphere is snow. And I think this... Yeah... Tatiana, you, you sent that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you. The beautiful photographs of snow. Snow is a, a characteristic of the Arctic, of course. But look at what's happening to snow. This is the June snow cover equivalent. And this is 1972, approximately now. Uh, the black are North American, the red are uh, European Arctic, and we're losing our snow cover. Um, the duration of snow cover has decreased by about two weeks over the 30 years. And, of course, you would assume that that's because of climate warming. But it's worse than that. So if we look at this picture, this is one particular day uh, in 2007 where there's a lot of pollution. Each of these black dots are dirty industries that are sending pollutants up into the atmosphere. And because of the winds in the high atmosphere, these pollutants are being um, blown to the Arctic. So this is Svalbard, and this is the tip of northeast Greenland. And you can see that what happens from here is blowing all the way into the high Arctic. It has problems for, of course, the, when you get particles of black carbon on the snow, it, um, it changes the albedo and the snow starts to melt more quickly. And these are guys on Svalbard um, just measuring the albedo of snow and the particles in snow. It gets worse than that because these particles, and it's not just black carbon, but it's uh, material from forest fires and uh, other windblown material gets into the Arctic. They are also uh, nutrients for um, bacteria and algae. And here you see different colours of snow. This is, should be white, but these are different colours of snow caused by different micro microorganisms in the snow cover. And that, again, changes albedo. So you've got a whole series of things coming together to make the snow go even faster. Another part of the, the cryosphere was um, the Greenland ice sheet, uh, which is the second biggest um, ice sheet in, in the world, uh, second only to Antarctica. And up until recently, the Greenland ice sheet was characterised by an accumulation zone on the high zone, high dome in the middle, and then um, an ablation zone around the coastline, where the, the glaciers were coming down into the fjord um, and that gave a balance, a, a, a fairly stable mass balance. But in 2012, uh, something unique happened for the first time in recorded history. And that was almost the whole surface of Greenland, even the high dome, two, uh, two kilometre altitude, uh, melted. Now, it's only the surface melt. Some of this ice is two kilometres thick, but nevertheless, that had not happened before. In the past, the old explorers from 100 years ago used to ski across the Greenland ice cap. Now they can't because you have rivers, you have waterfalls, you have lakes on the top of the, the Greenland ice sheet. And then we have uh, glaciers, and I know there are people in the audience who know far more about glaciers than I do, but uh, wherever you go in the world, they're shrinking. These are just two examples from West Greenland of rapidly shrinking uh, glaciers. Um, this is from uh, Canada, 1941. The same, same glacier in 2004. It's obvious the photos show you far more than a graph. And this is where you will go tomorrow. Um, and this glacier too has been shrinking. And it interests me because we have colonisation. You can't see it, but there are trees on the moraines higher than the glaciers now. The colonisation process is going so fast. Then another part of the, um, the cryosphere is permafrost. And immediately I will say sorry to Valeria, if there somewhere. Um, th this is biased by North American measurements, and there aren't sufficient 
uh, Russian measurements in here. But if you drill a hole through the permafrost and measure temperature, this is what happens to the, the temperature. Almost every borehole shows an increase in temperature over time. Now, if you are looking at very cold permafrost, like many areas of northern uh, Siberia, and the, particularly the, uh, the northeast, then you have cold permafrost, minus 16. If that warms by one or, one or two degrees, it doesn't mean anything. It's only then minus 14, but it will still be there for thousands of years. But if you have warm permafrost, which is only minus one, then if that increases by two degrees, suddenly you get no permafrost. And this is what is happening. Here, these are pulsar mires um, underlain by permafrost in, uh, in Sweden, northern Sweden. But these are melting now and leading to what we call thermocast wetlands because the permafrost is, is going. The other um, problem of thawing permafrost, if the ground is rich in uh, water or the permafrost is rich in water, then when that water moves and thaws, um, it, you get uh, subsidence to the ground. And this is what happens. This is Canada, uh, where communities are having to move or rebuild because of permafrost destruction. These are roads in Alaska, um, buildings somewhere in Siberia, and a beautiful mire near where you will go, where the permafrost is melting so quickly that as soon as you get a thermocast pond, the trees move in I almost immediately. Very strange landscape, but I think something happening really quickly. And then fr Sergei gave me this slide showing the vulnerability of many areas in Siberia to permafrost thaw. All these are pipelines. And if they thaw like this, or the ground underneath thaws like that, um, then there will be some major problems. But I have to say that when I was in Sabeta with this very new uh, plant, they had all sorts of very high-tech solutions for all their buildings. And it was a, a, an amazing piece of technological design. The other problem we have now, which I, I can't show you, unfortunately, is we have mini pingos, which explode. And there were 7,000 counted in the Yamal area. These are only maybe one, two meters high, little mounds. Um, but they are concentrations of permafrost, and suddenly they explode. And uh, they throw out all the ground around them, and you see a plume of smoke and fire. And we don't want any of those occurring underneath these pipelines. That's a very new phenomenon. In fact, so new, I don't think we've got a name for them yet. They're called... Uh, that's the end product, once they've blown. Yeah. But you don't know what the actual mound is called yet. Whether it's a... Uh, yeah. But it's a, they've been called mini pingos. Um, yeah. Yeah, but small ones. Okay, and of course, permafrost um, determines hydrology. Uh, permafrost is impermeable to water. So if permafrost melts and there's a lot of water around, then the water just sits there. But if there's a, some better drainage, then the water will flow away. So you can hi either have creation of lakes or drainage of lakes. And there are two studies on the same area which show the ab absolute opposite trends. That This is um, an early uh, plot by Smith et al. showing disappearing lakes. Every red dot is a disappearing lake. But then here's a table um, from Polishuk et al. Um, in uh, Sergei's group, which shows that the lakes are forming. These are formed lakes and these are disappeared lakes. So two different papers in the same area, but showing two different trends. And if you ask me what is the greatest um, question to solve on land in the Arctic, it's simply the hydrology. What is happening to the tundra? Is it drying out or is it getting wetter? Of course, changes in the hydrology, changes in the snow regime, changes in temperature, they all affect the vegetation. And in uh, 2013, the most rigorous um, map of greening, I'm calling it greening in inverted commas, because there was a fashion that the Arctic was going to get greener because of increased temperatures. So this map actually shows those areas that greened up with green and purple marks. The areas which uh, didn't are, have no color. And there are some areas, very few, but there are areas of brown, where it had a browning. That's death of the plants or decreased productivity. What people didn't do, and this is something about the philosophy of science, there were some people who saw that the Arctic was greening. So a lot of people went out and followed the fashion in science of looking for areas that were greening. And they found them, of course. If you go out to look for something, you usually find it. Um, and it gave us a false view. So people look at that graph 
and say, okay, so 37% of the Arctic is green. That's really exciting. But they don't think about the other um, 63% that hasn't changed or is brown. But now we did the analysis later, so this is now 2016, and what we see is a greening has happened up to about this stage, but now we've got a browning. So if you compare the start and end points, from 1980 to present, really there's been no change in the Arctic, but there have been some very dynamic processes going on. And we don't understand enough about those processes um, to understand and predict. And this is dangerous. So again, I'm going to tease you. Uh, does anyone know what this species is? The white one. No? Eriophorum vaginatum. You know the species, maybe? It's a very characteristic Arctic species. But this is everywhere. It hasn't really responded to climate warming. So no one is looking at it. The second uh, is exactly the same species. This is at about uh, 68 degrees north, north of the Brooks Range in, the, in Alaska. That one's at my home. So this is the UK tundra. So many of the species that you get in the Arctic, the widespread species, you can also find them way, way far south. Um, so they are not really threatened by increased in temperature. It must be something else. But the danger is that if we forget these species, because they're so widespread, they're everywhere, that when they do collapse, when they pass a threshold, then we have a major, major problem for the Arctic. If we have a few rare species disappearing with local distribution, it's sad, but it's not going to change the Arctic. If we get what the Russians call the superdominance disappearing, then we have problems. Then remember the ecotome, the, where the, the, uh, the Arctic tundra meets the boreal forest or the taiga. And I told you that the tree line is moving. Well, it is in some areas. But again, it's more complicated than biologists want to think. So these are very old photos. I apologize for the quality. But this is northern uh, Swedish Lapland. This is 1906. This is exactly the same photo, 1986. Look at the forest. This is another area, 1906. You can't even see it in 1987 because the forest has regrown. Climate warming? Well, maybe. But if you look very carefully at these photos, what you see here, this is a Sami Kota. These are Sami reindeer herders, lap reindeer herders. And they built all their living shelters out of wood, all their utensils, their kitchen things out of wood. They burnt wood as a fuel. Now they're living in, in concrete houses like we are. Uh, so what's happened between here and here is climate change and land use change. But the problem is we don't understand the land use change because it's changed before World War II. So we don't have that memory. The indigenous peoples do, and they have something called traditional ecological knowledge. And we scientists don't use that knowledge enough. And because of that, we make some big mistakes. Here's another example. This magnificent forest here, what you see here are goats. These are goats in the mountains of Sweden. They don't exist there anymore. They disappeared 80 years ago. But again, unless we can find an old photo in an old historical book, we misinterpret the modern dynamics of the ecosystems. So this is a frightening lesson for us to learn. The other problem we have as, si as scientists is we're very clever at modeling trends, long-term trends. We know it's going to get warmer into the future. We can model that. We can mod model variability around that trend. So we know there will be extreme warm periods, extreme cold periods along that trend. But what we don't know is when those extremes will be, will happen. And that is very frightening, because at the moment we're seeing more and more events, such as rain on snow events in the middle of winter, periods in the middle of the Arctic winter when there's no snow, and instead there's a layer of ice on the ground. When that happens, reindeer die. Um, when the reindeer die, there is a shift in the biodiversity. New species come in to scavenge the dead bodies, crows, foxes, and so on. So we have a step change in biodiversity, which we normally expect to take hundreds of years, happening in just a few weeks. Um, and then there are other problems like uh, tundra fires. This is a fire from the northern slope of Alaska. It happened in uh, 2007. And within just a few weeks, the amount of carbon that was released into the atmosphere is equivalent to uh, 70 years of carbon capture. So it will take 70 years for that carbon to be put back, just a result of something that happens in a week or two. So these are frightening 
events. And just uh, the Yamal incident, by the way, it was 55,000 reindeer that died in just a few weeks as a result of one extreme event that takes a few, week, few days or a few weeks. And we can't model when those events will happen. The next one is extreme rainfall events. Again, this is from where I used to work in Sweden. We have the longest record, I don't know about Russia, but for the West we have the longest record of climate in the Arctic. This is 68 degrees north. Ev and this is starting 1910. Every one of these dots is an extreme rainfall event. They're not very big because this is a uh, dry area of, of uh, uh, Scandinavia. But what you'll see are extremes of extremes. We don't know how to characterize those statistically because there's so few of them. But these, oh, everything's extreme there. But these guys, they're really frightening because these are bigger than we've ever seen before. And this is what happened in, in 2004. Mountain sides going all the way back into distance just slip and fall away. Um, bridges between northern Sweden and northern Norway disappear. The problem is that when we build, we have a budget which is adapted to the return frequency of an event. And I assume you've, you know that term, return frequency of an event. What we're doing is coming to a, a period in our climate where there is no return frequency of an event. So what do we plan for? We can't plan for the one in 50 year event, the one in 100 year event, because every one of these is a new record. So how do we plan? It's a, a tricky problem. I won't talk about carbon in the Arctic soil, I'll just give you a couple of definitions. This is your doma soils, very deep organic soils uh, from eastern Siberia. And I told you this already, that because the, 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 uh, the decomposition and release of carbon is a lot slower than the carbon uptake because of permafrost, then you get a big accumulation of carbon. And we have twice, or three, um, three times, uh, yeah, twice, the carbon in these soils as we have in the atmosphere. And we think that um, as the permafrost thaws, the soils get warmer, the microbes work faster, then a lot of this carbon will be released into the atmosphere. And the plants that take that up to um, in, in increase photosynthesis are not working as fast as the release. So we will have a, a net positive feedback. The same is true for, for methane. This is methane in a lake in, uh, in Siberia somewhere. We have these big continental shelves off the Siberian coastline. And incidentally, these were um, dry land uh, tundra ecosystems uh, 10,000 years ago or more. This is what we see now, these sunken um, continental shelves covered by seawater, is an artifact of um, sea level rise. And those shells are rich in in carbon, that's why we have a lot of oil plants around uh, the coastlines of Alaska and Siberia. And these are the measurements of, of methane coming up from these carbon deposits um, in the water column. We don't know what the processes are of that methane getting released into the atmosphere, um, but if it does, it will be quite serious. The other feedback we have to the Arctic is uh, the albedo feedback. I mentioned already that snow has a high albedo. Um, but if we look at vegetation change, then we have an albedo effect due to vegetation change. This is the albedo of snow, very high albedo. This is heathland, like you see up here, which has um, got a lower albedo. The meadow, you see here, is even lower. And uh, wetlands and shrubs, like you see here, have got very low albedo until you get bare soil with the lowest albedo. And incidentally, if you get something like Sitka spruce, then it's got a really low albedo. So what we're doing is we're following a trajectory driven by climate change of decreasing albedo, not just by releasing snow, but also by changing the vegetation as we go through vegetation successions. So this is another important feedback to climate change. I've measured mentioned sea level several times and uh, the breakup of sea ice. When you have a breakup of sea ice, you also reduce albedo. So you have a dark water surface taking up uh, heat energy, leading to a positive feedback and speeding up the disappearance of sea ice. And when that happens, two things happen. One is you get an increase in sea level, which hits places like Florida in that case, um, Miami there. Um, and you get the teleconnections between the Arctic 
um, and the mid latitudes, leading to new storms, new storm surges that have devastating uh, effects. Now, this is where I, I get political, so you have to bear with me. I was part of the very first IPCC, and they, we, we, we told the world in 1990, and then the Arctic Climate Impact as, uh, um, Assessment repeated in 2005, that changes in the amount of precipitation significantly altered hydrological regime, sea level rise, and increased variability will lead to all these problems. So we knew it 30 years ago, 30 years ago, and no one's done anything. If we look at the effects now spread out over the world, we can put us in two categories, Arctic residents, the global community, and we can look at the challenges and the opportunities. And let's, let's start with the, uh, the global community. The major challenge, in my view, except with one exception that I'll come to, is sea level rise. That is going to displace millions of people. If we look at opportunities now, the global population will have the biggest opportunity in new areas for oil and glass exploration and new transport routes and so on. If we look at the indigenous peoples, what are the challenges? Well, maybe one of the biggest challenges is insecure um, routes on ice and snow and loss of traditional food sources. The opportunities, they're very few. They're losing their homelands, they're using their way of life. They may get rich, but what do they do when they get rich? They move somewhere else. Um, so these opportunities um, are not there too much for the indigenous peoples. Now, let's look at project outwards now to what you will suffer in your lives and your children. Um, recently, uh, sea level rise in the next 50 years is likely to affect over 140 million people. That's the st statistic. About 140 million people will either have to build seawall defences or move, physically move. And the, the horrible graphic here is just about people tens of thousands of migrants coming from Sy Syria and, uh, and North Africa, and Europe can't deal with those. And you know about the mess in the US with the, the Mexican migrants. So at the moment, planet Earth and the, the, the societies we have cannot cope with a few tens of thousands of migrants. What's going to happen when there are tens of millions on the move? Is we have to plan for it now. And although it's politically incorrect to talk about this thing, you have to be honest, you have to put this out there so we can plan, otherwise it will be a disaster. And the worst case scenario, I said the worst case scenario of global change for me was sea level rise apart from one thing. And that one thing is geopolitical conflict. So as people move around, as resources become um, expended in some places but more available in others, then there is going to be geopolitical conflict. And we can see some of that even now. And this is a very low level, by the way. So we're not talking about wars, but we're talking about irritations, if you know that word. We're talking about people um, being angry rather than going to war. But if we look at this, this, this is the Northwest Passage. Remember this, the uh, sea ice retreat? The Northwest Passage is now becoming open to navigation. It is the shortest distance between the Pacific and the Atlantic. It's extremely important for North America, um, uh, for the US, because otherwise, if they want to get from Seattle to New England, they would have to go through Panama Canal. And the size is limited. The size of ships is limited by the width of Panama Canal. So the Americans are refusing to accept that the Northwest Passage is Canadian waters. And the Canadian government is very angry about that and saying these are territorial waters. The, the, the US is only one of 170 countries that has not signed the uh, Treaty of the Sea. So they will not do that because they, they claim that they can use this um, independently of, um, uh, of Canada and the Canadian rights. So now, just this, this year, the, uh, the indigenous people who live in this area are taking the US to court, the UN court, claiming that the UN is violating their human rights because these people have been there for thousands of years, long before the US was established. So that's one irritation. The next irritation is that I went here to the New Siberian Islands in 1994. I can't go back because this is a big Russian military base. And the shortest way from Russia to Alaska is across the Arctic Ocean. So now there is increased um, Russian action <coughs> in the Arctic, strategic action. 
The US is also doing this. So the US is, uh, is now putting troops back into Iceland. It's also, and I, I've got to put this in quotation mark, putting a diplomatic uh, presence, uh, sorry, here, in Greenland. What that diplomatic presence means is 7,000 troops. And they've already lost a nuclear warhead here in Greenland. Um, so here you get military um, actions um, or the chance, risk of military actions increasing. And then the North Pole, several countries, all the countries with an Arctic ocean, uh, uh, a coastline are claiming the North Pole. And that's not been uh, validated yet. And now a new one is for China. China has the concept of a, a polar silk road. So China is becoming very involved in, in the Arctic, um, beca mainly because of the sea route. So um, China has funded uh, part of this Sabeta plant to over 40% in Yamal. So it's got a presence on the Siberian coastline. It's built a research station in Iceland. Uh, so it's got a presence in Iceland. It tried to build airports in, um, in Canada, uh, sorry, in, in Greenland. And that's why the US have come in now, uh, because the, there was a, a strategic battle between the two as to who should have a presence in Greenland. It doesn't matter about the Greenlanders, of course. And the worry is that the conflict rhetoric has increased dramatically. So here you see some news, line, news headlines from the West. Take a tour of Russia's new otherworldly Arctic military base. Russian Navy reports progress in building East Arctic base. Canada hikes military spending as Trump demands allies step up. Canada will improve missile defense. Russian embassy. Norway-Russia relations to deteriorate following US Marines base extension in Norway. Russia is not the only challenge perceived by the West. And again, it comes back to the, uh, the, the challenge about the Northwest Passage. So there is a big ch challenge between Canada and US as well. So it's not just an East-West, simple East-West divide. I'm going to shift gear entirely now to a new subject. Because of these geopolitical tensions arising from climate change, way beyond what we expected just from the environmental impacts, it's really essential to try to develop diplomacy through science, not just through, um, through our political uh, embassies in different countries. And one organization that I'm proud of, uh, which uh, we're trying to do this, is Interact. And Interact is a, an EU-funded consortium, but we've been going for nearly 20 years now. And we are a collection of research stations um, throughout the North. We have 86 research stations in 18 countries. And where you'll go to tomorrow, actually, is one of those stations. Um, it, not quite on the map, I don't think. Um, many of these, and these stations are working together across 18 countries. And they're exchanging scientists. We have a fund available to put scientists into the field to stations that offer access. And Actru and Kanime and Kaibasovo um, and many others in Russia are offering that access. What's clever about this EU program is the access is transnational. So if you're a Russian or working in Russia, you cannot apply for funding to go to a Russian research station. But you're welcome in Greenland, Alaska, Canada, Svalbard, anywhere else. And that ensures that we have a mix of cultures and, and, and new collaboration starting up. And this is just, uh, you know, when you get on, on your plane, you look at the flights and see where the flights are going to. Um, this is just a, a map of where uh, people are going, coming from and going to. Um, this, is, this is out of date. This is only 2015. But so far, uh, we've put 900 people into the field. So as well as enhancing the research we do, it also builds um, an understanding between different nations of how to work together. And <coughs> What is interesting is this is not started by big government agencies. This is independent, but it's re reached the attention of the government agencies. So again, we go back to Salikard, and this is Maria Zakharova, uh, who is a spokeswoman for the foreign ministry in Russia. And she met a, a small group that were invited to Sabeta, and she actually asked me to take a message back to the UK government, telling them that they wanted better relationships between UK and Russia. So I'm just a scientist, but this is a messenger from the Russian foreign ministry to the British foreign ministry through a scientist. 
And that is the stage we've got to. And this is being recognised. I'm sorry, this is not about ego. So please forgive me for showing this slide. But this is Prince Charles giving me a medal. And that is for science diplomacy. It's not for my work on ecology, unfortunately. But it's for the work on trying to bring people from the world together. Um, so it is being recognised at a very high level. And now, the sad part. We, we've done, dealt with one sad part, which is the geo conflict. But this is another photo I'm proud of. This is the very first group from IPCC. And it was before this photo was taken when we just got together before the IPCC report was made. So this is 1988-89. I'd still got dark hair there, black hair. Um, and this is a guy called Bert Bolin from Sweden who started the whole process. Um, but these were the first guys uh, that were working on Working Group 1, which was a basic science behind climate change. And, of course, we've repeated this many, many times. Um, but no one listened to us. No one listened to my generation. But now something exciting is happening, and that's hopefully the younger generation will have a greater impact than we did at communicating. So this is uh, Greta Thunberg from Sweden, and she is reaching international governments at 16 years old, which is phenomenal. And now we have all sorts of processes going on. So this is about the government of Luxembourg. We've got together about a 1,000 young people and made, we made, got the experts to talk to them. I was one of them. And they made a, a video film about climate change. They made a report on climate change. And these kids from school have now gone to Parliament in Luxembourg and given the Prime Minister um, a list of things they want him to do. So it's amazing that young people, and you're still young, can have this effect. And then my last slide, and sorry some of you will have seen this before, um, but I, I've been around the world giving these talks and they're always a little bit negative with geoconflict and changing Arctic and so on. Um, and I, the worst case for me is going to a school of very young children and telling them of all the problems but not being able to tell them how to solve the problems. Um, and then one guy, a German guy in the rural valley, an industrialist, said, don't worry, Terry. He said, do you have any grandchildren? I said, yes, I have four grandchildren. This is one of them, this is Kira. Um, <coughs> I said, what happens if you want to take her out on a picnic um, and the, the weather's bad? Well, it's simple. You just put appropriate clothes on her and we still go out and have fun. He said, yeah, it's the same for climate change. That the young people, and this includes all you, will live in a different world tomorrow. But if you're prepared for it, if you're adapted, it will still be a good world. But the secret is being adapted for it. So jobs for me and people like me is to go around the world and try to help people to realise what could be ahead of them, to realise that there could be geoconflicts, there could be mass migrations, there could be loss of Arctic environments. But if you're prepared for them, you can minimise the impact. Um, so thank you very much for your attention.